Welcome back to part two of this big interview. Walter Smith, here, takes us to Ibrox, where he served first as an assistant to Graham Souness, and of course, later, became a celebrated Rangers manager in his own right. That move to Glasgow to the club he supported as a boy introduced Walter Smith to a facet of coaching he'd never experienced at United, with Rangers able to source and buy great footballers. Walter was responsible for bringing some undeniably brilliant footballers to Ibrox, and he tells a story of how he convinced Brian Loudrup to move to Scotland and to become a Rangers legend. Another famous acquisition was Gaza. Walter had no trouble in selling the club to Paul Gascoigne, as he's going to explain, but the former Rangers manager recalls with some affection the various challenges which did come with managing a unique character like Gaza. Enjoy this one. The big interview is there for you. Love you. We are uh, sitting by the banks of Loch Lomond. Um, it's a privilege and an honour. Quite exciting too, after a long time not seeing you, to be with Walter Smith. Walter, thank you very much indeed. Before we came on the mic here, we talked about Graham, you talked about his presence. There's something extra that he's got on and off the pitch, apart from having a brilliant idea, tempo setting. When you first meet for business, when, when the possibility to go and work with them comes, what's that meeting like? What's the draw? My contention is, based on what he's told us, and says regularly, is that he was a very different man then than he is now. Well, like everyone else, I mean, I, I, I suppose that that would be the case. Um, I must admit, he gave me, you know, five... Thoroughly enjoyable years. I loved it at the time. You know, when you, you go into Rangers, I said I was a boyhood supporter. So when Graham asked me if I would come along um, with him, you know, uh, I'd been 20 years at Dundee United, more or less, with a little break at Dumbarton, but I'd been nearly 20 years at Dundee United. And uh, When I was asked to go to Rangers with Graham, it was, I, I, I mean, I had, I had something I just had to do. So uh, I left. the link? I want to know if, if you'll share... Why? Why does he pick you? What are the What are the? Well, limits? I think I think what, what happened there. He was looking for someone who had the, the knowledge of, of Scottish football, if you like, who, who was in a coaching environment already to uh, to help him out because he he had obviously been in Italy with Sampdoria for for um, what three years and you know when he asked, I accepted and um, we started down a year, five years together. It was great. Um, I must admit, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it, it was great for me because Jim McLean had a specific way of working. I, I was his assistant for a number of years, going on to work with Graham, who's entirely different. For example, you know, well, I mean, Graham obviously, but Jim was all coaching, yeah, yeah everything. Where Graham's Liverpool background was one of, um, you know, the whole lot, and Bob Paisley and, and the others there were great footballing people, very, very knowledgeable people. But, would put a team together and would say and make their demands on a team where this is the way we're going to play and we'll put you together and you do what you do, you know, you go and play. And they engendered a great atmosphere within the Liverpool team. This is Graham telling me, I, I, I didn't know. So he, he, you know, so he brought that uh, with him. Graham would always say to me, you know, we have to get good players in every position. That's what we do. And then we make sure that they have the proper motivation and we bring the best out in them. And, you know, when you see Dundee United, Jim McLean had to rear these players and, and bring them up. We were moving into a circumstance here where you were bringing players in from other clubs and fitting them into your team. So it was a slightly um, different way of doing things. Um, That's exciting. So you get with him to go and say, there's a player, there's a fantastic player. He fits our system, he's got extra above and beyond his technical ability, let's go sign him. Yes. That's a very heady experience to... Yeah, as to get, to try, and, and it brought a realisation to me that, you know, like at Dundee United, we were all in it together. We were all guys who had been brought up in the same environment, more or less. Uh, even the boys they brought in, like Paul Hegarty and Eamon Barnett, were very young when they came into Dundee United. So they, 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 were, they were brought up, and that. Whereas here, 
you were having to recreate a circumstance almost immediately. Mm. As is happening in modern, more modern football now, players moving from one club to another happens far more often now um, than, than used to happen. So therefore, you know, it's important that when you bring them in, in a, in a modern idiom, that your player fits in to your team and you can get that going. So that, back in that period of time, was what it was. And we inherited the team that hadn't been doing too well at the time. Jock Wallace had come back for the second time. Big Jock had been brilliant in his, his first spell as a Rangers manager. He had been fantastic. And, but symptomatic a lot of modern times, Rangers, due to the disaster, had to build their own stadium. They built the modern Ibrox, and it was fantastic. But it meant then that there wasn't a great deal of, of money. Not that money was as it is at the present day, but it was still a vital factor. And um, it meant that Dundee United and Aberdeen um, could pay as much money as Rangers and Celtic to, to keep their players um, at their club. So that was changing a little bit through Graham. Graham obviously came in and was able to play for a year himself, which was a brilliant start for us. But um, we only brought in Chris Woods and Terry Butcher. And these were the three mainstay of a team that went on to play for the majority of, of the year. The rest of the players were all up. Colin West we brought in, but he got injured right away. And um, he hardly played that season at all. So we really only had three new players. And um, the influence that those three players had was fantastic. Chris Woods were a great goalie. Terry Butcher and Graeme Sooners were probably um, two of the best motivators on the pitch that I've worked with. Um, they were great. They had a great presence, you know, and they showed me on a personal basis a, a, a different um, kind of view. We had Dundee United. We were all teamwork. These players had a presence on the pitch that the boys at Dundee United didn't have. They were, they were better. They took how, the responsibility. How can you? It's just something different. It's, 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 the, the, there's a magnetism. There's, there's a charisma. Uh, that's a, well, not, not just because we can say the obvious things about both Terry and Graham. We're both. In sporting terms, they're both very aggressive. That's a given, and it's yes. true. There's no question about that. But there's something else, and, and you've used the word leaders, but managers, are, there's a leadership quality. Right, right. I, I don't know what words to use about to, to try and break it down and describe it, because it isn't just raw aggression. I don't think that's true at all. No, 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 not, no, not no, close. no. I don't mean that. that, that, that what, I, what I mean was that they, they, they brought something to it, they brought a personality. The team. You're saying a, a, a magnetism there, right? but they brought up their personality and to the team, and it wasn't the manager who was imposing the personality on. And Graham Soonis, he's, he's me, Graham's time, uh, for him it was difficult because he was a player and a manager. But for Terry, Terry was our captain, and you know Terry Butcher led as a person. He led different for a player to lead than for a manager to lead, and he he led as a captain. And uh, it was fantastic for us. So we had, we had only three guys in, but they, they, these, Chris was a great goalkeeper. But Terry and Graham had this personality that imposed himself on the rest of the team. And we went on to win the league um, that year, which was um, a, a remarkable turnaround. And to be fair, all the guys who were there and some great players there, you know, David Cooper, uh, you know, Alan, Alan McCoyst. Um, you know, a young Ian Durant, you know, were, they, were, they, were, they were terrific. Um, Derek Ferguson was a good young player as well. And they, they were all in there learning. We had some decent pros, Cammy Fraser and, and others in the team. Jimmy Nicholl came in to play for us. You know, others, they, they, we, we, boys who... So we got our team together there. And um, as I say, Graham played all the first year. And then, obviously, the second year, he was just reaching the end and only played... Um, occasional games, but um, it was the start of a great spell for us, I must say, and one that uh, that took me into a, uh, another kind of footballing world from the one I had been um, brought up in at Dundee United. When he moves on, one of the things that sticks in my mind is that um, you have another European adventure which takes you within a goal of the European Cup final. Yeah, Rangers beat Lingby. Leeds United play against an extraordinary Marseille side. And if I'm not wrong, looking at it here, if you win the last game in Group A, 
is when the Champions League was divided differently. It's the first season of the Champions League, I reckon. Um, after the draw in the Velodrome against Olympic Marseille, a home game against Moscow, CSKA Moscow, would see you through to what is the Champions League final, effectively. Mm, well, the, 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 the game, the second last game in Marseille was the game, you know, more than anything, that um, if we had won that match, we were through to the final. Guaranteed. Uh, yeah. And, uh, this is a Marseille of Barthez, Bolly, Anglema, Des, oh, Desai, yeah, the, the full Didier Deschamps, Abdi Pelli, Rudy Voller, Alan Boxic, managed by the great Raymond Gottels. Ah, uh, we had uh, we had a, a great. But the thing about that was that, that, that team, our team had just kind of started the European adventure, and we, and the first game at Ibrox, the game against Marseille, and um, oh, the, we had preliminary rounds there. It was it was a different way of doing the Champions League at that time. The preliminary rounds were there, and we had to play in Copenhagen, and we had to, we had to play um, against Leeds, um, and the, and these qualified you for the sections, and then um, in the sections there, we got in the first game we played Marseille, we were well beaten. We drew, but we were well beaten. <laughs> um, they they were terrific uh, in the night, and uh, they were. They were a really, really good team. And we managed to score two goals late in the game to get a two-each draw. And, um, you know, um, they looked far better than us in that one. But as we went on in the group, we gained a lot of confidence there. And when we went back to Marseille to play... Um, if anybody who hasn't been there, that's, that's also heated, passionate, hostile, difficult place. Hell of a stadium. It's... Yeah. It, it, no matter that we've listed all the players there and, and a wonderful manager, that, that's a venue. And they were more nervous than we were in that one. You know, that was another game where Scottish teams have, have been caught up in bribery scandals and different things like that. Um, well, there's, again... Uh, this is a Marseille side that gets stripped of the French title in that era for having bribed referees. There was, yeah, get, same European-wise. Um, they get caught there, but... Um, Referee was Dutch, and uh, there was no question on that night that there was no problem in that respect. Uh, you know, it wasn't the, it was there. It was just galling that you know it could have happened in other games. In the context of that, the referees um, who refereed our, our game against Bruges, Ibrox, prior to the game against um, Marseille, was one that um, was. Um, again, held up the suspicion um, afterwards. And the only contentious thing I would have said was in that Bruce game, um, Mark Haley got sent off, which meant that he missed the game in Marseille. Um, and that was the only thing that I could look at in the, in the game. I thought that was... A Polish referee. Contentious one. Sent off just before half-time. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, so the idea is that uh, it's uh, not uh, just uh, on uh, your performance... It's also on Ach, little it, intangibles. When the game when the game's not straight, it's like how have Marseille been refereed in other games? The, the game, the game, everybody that, that, that uh, there's loads of other teams suffer from that. I like to forget about it now and just go and, and what happened. And on that day, we played as well in the game in Marseille as Marseille played in the game at Ibrox. We played really well in that game, and we young Gary McSweegan came on. And, um, just about scored in the last seconds of the game, that would have taken us to the final. So uh, it was, um, it was, it was there, and the the, the, the draw meant that, that we had a, a circumstance where we had to uh, to go to uh, uh, Marseille had to go to Bruges, and you've got Moscow and here. We had to we played CSKA at um, at, at home, so. Um, they are redrew nil nil as it turned out, but Marseille only had to win the game in Bruges, and they did. So um, um, they got to the final and they won the they won the, the, the European Cup there. But it was a great campaign for us. It was um, it was one that um, you know we played exceptionally well in it. We had a, a fantastic season that season. You know we were in the midst of um, one where we we had a, a run of a games where we we went forty four matches without losing, and uh, it was. Uh, that was great, 1992-93, so it was, we had one year build up when Graham left and I, one year then we got our team together in the second year there, it was a fantastic season for us. So, uh, 
And as close as a Scottish disappointing, but, um, club's been to a European Cup final or Champions League final since and, and for some foreseeable time, I'd suggest. Um, it's a long time ago, but to be that close was a hell of an achievement. Yes, it was great. Does there. it niggle? Does the, it AC niggle? Milan, the AC Milan team at the time was just on its way down. You know, they had been the, the preeminent team for a number of years had been great and they were just getting to that stage where they were and they weren't as good as, as they were so I mean we, we were up there and we it was a winnable we final. had improved dramatically and in, in, in European terms even over that competition we were playing better at the end of it European wise than, than we were um, at the start of it some of the greatest football that I saw in your teams even though you've emphasised teamwork throughout, growing it at United, trying to find it when you purchase at Rangers, came from individuals. There's two in particular, Lydrup and Gascoigne, who played fantastic football um, for you. I'm interested about the, the process of how you sign men like them. Let's leave wages aside. People pay big wages, footballers are tempted by wages, that's fine. But the actual act of saying, how do I get a player like that? How do I persuade them? How do I sell them the, the package? That's, that became something that you were very successful at, very good at, and brought, I think, brought Scottish football some of its great characters. Tell me a little bit about, first of all, Brian, the how. How'd you get him? What's the process? What were the ups and downs? I think the, the process um, uh, was, uh, at the time, you know, when you work closely with your chairman, your owner, or whatever, um, we were in the midst of um, a team that had played exceptionally well for three years when I took over. We had to change the team around from... Graham and I were in the process of changing the team because the three former rule for European games was coming in. So therefore, we, we had to have a circumstance... Change the balance. ...where uh, we were turning around a lot of players with a lot of English players who were obviously classed as formers and um, we were having to, to change that around um, so when Graham left I had to continue that process so um, you know the, that team when it changed had three four years of exceptional football they played very well and I started to say well you know we've got to find something to bring an extra spark to us so um, you look around then all of a sudden, uh, I read in a newspaper that um, Gascoigne's leaving Lazio. And I had met him on holiday the, the year before in Florida. And um, so I... Just bumped into him? Yeah, he was in the same hotel. So I, 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 I'd met him. And, uh, he didn't know who I was, but I mean, uh, yeah, that's Paul. But anyway, I, I had my two boys with us, so they obviously knew who he was. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And like, um, like everybody else said, when I was wandering about a beach, they'd start to play football with the kids and you get to know them. So I thought he would bring a, a, a much needed spark to her. And sure enough, when I sat down, the chairman, I said, look, you know, I've got opportunity here. Uh, I said, Gascoigne's coming back. Why don't we? And now, when you look at it now and you look at the premiership now, but then Rangers, Celtic, you know, could compete. still compete. And that it was just after the middle 90s it started to go away from us in terms of finance. But we could still compete. The chairman got in touch with the uh, president at Lazio and said, you know, we would be interested in signing Paul Gascoigne. And um, he, uh, he said, fine, OK, there's a number of English clubs want, we're going to transfer them at the end of the season, you know. So, so the chairman said, well, can we speak to the player? Yeah. So uh, it was the end of the season. And um, so I just got on a flight to Rome and um, they, the people at Lazio gave me his address and, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I stayed in the hills uh, outside Rome and I, I just got a taxi and went up and doorstepped him. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, I thought it was all a lot more scientific and complex than turning up and saying... No, well, it wasn't even a matter of watching Paul Gascoigne play because, I mean, he didn't play, he was injured. Uh, you know, he'd been out of a broken leg for yeah. that, most of that season. Um, so uh, I, 
I, I went up and chopped his door and uh, I, yeah, I heard the quad bike. I, I didn't know it was a quad bike at the time, but I heard this machine coming up and the doors open. And he looked at me and, and he says to me, what are you doing here? He said, uh, I'm, uh, I said, I'm here to try and get you to come and sign for Rangers. He said, okay. <laughs> No way. He did. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not joking, I'm not joking. He said to me, <laughs> uh, he said to me, okay. So, um, I, and to, to the day I said, the people are likely to tell you that Rangers had been, no, no, no. He said, I, I, I didn't know he was coming. And um, so uh, he had been going away on holiday and I was very fortunate I got him the day before he was going away. So um, we had, an interesting day um, <laughs> uh, at his place, and then I, I got a car back to the airport and flew back. And true to his word, he, uh, his agents at the time wanted him to go to an English club, and but uh, he said no. I said uh, I'm going to Rangers, so uh, and he stuck it out. And fairness to him, so uh, we eventually got him. That was great. What was it like? Because I've met him, and um, I think the world of him. It's a, we've spoken about him so often in the podcast, particularly um, when we were talking about Chrissy Waddle, who roomed with him, and he's got the same affection as I had. <laughs> Chris kind of did a little grimace in the snort that water's coming. Yeah, Chris was the same. It was sort of like half love, half how did I live through that? And, yeah. and Gaza's throwing arm came up a lot because. Chris said on England trips, particularly if the if the hotel was anywhere near a public area, Gaz would buy boxes of eggs and sit by the window with all the patience of a Second World War sniper and pick people off. Ah, I, I mean, you know, everybody's got that that kind of story. See, just the, the fact that he came, and uh, I must admit, he, he, you know, for us, he, he needed that. Brian Lowry, you know, again, we needed a player. You couldn't have two opposite types of, of guys. People. Brian, yeah. Brian was unhappy in, in, in Italy because the, the way of life, he, he, the intensity of it all and the, uh, how the fans are on top of them all the time and everywhere they go was something that, um, that Brian himself didn't particularly... I didn't know that at the time, but it was there. But uh, my colleague Archie Knox, I've been following, the, we, we used to just follow national teams as such, you know, and go to international games. So I would do more Southern Europe, Archie would do Northern European ones. And um, I said to him, look, um, you know, I see that um, one of our scouts had said to us, you know, Brian Lauder, uh, I see that he, he's free. He played for AC Milan mm -hmm. um, and his last year on loan from Fiorentina. So he was going back to Fiorentina again. Um, so he didn't want to go back. And uh, he knew he was leaving Milan. And um, we uh, thought, well, why not? So again, uh, we got in touch with the club and asked for permission to talk to the player. So Fiorentina gave that permission. And um, so I went and met Brian, sat down, spoke to him. And he said, I want to come to Scotland to see what it's like and where we'll live. So um, he came to Helensburg that we were talking about in the early part of the interview and the, so he could enjoy this view. And um, Brian was a home-loving, quiet guy who really enjoyed it because he could come home. Nobody bothered him. Uh, he didn't get bothered anywhere. And he was just allowed to go and play football. And um, it's fantastic input for us. It was great. There, there has to be days. I, over our conversations throughout my uh, career, I've sold you ideas that are in my head and you're much more pragmatic and practical. But there has to be days when you're sitting on the bench, irrespective of you're winning that game or you're about to win a trophy, and you sit and watch and you go, you know, I signed that guy. That's the right guy. That's, uh, that's beautiful football. There, there, are, there are a few times, um, you know, for a manager, to, uh, you know, a few players through your career who, you know, when they were in the team that you were in charge of or, 
as a coach or the manager, who you were always hoping would get on the ball, you know, and you would hope that they would go on the ball because they supplied something that you didn't really know was going to happen. You know, for a lot of other guys, once you get used to them, you, you know what a player's going to do in certain circumstances, where he's going to play. So that Brian Lowderton and Paul Gascoigne brought us back to a team that badly needed it, and they saw us through some, you know, difficult years at, at the end to try and win nine in a row, and a big thing in Scotland to, to equal Celtic's achievement. So, um, you know, for us, um, I sat there and, and watched them, and both of them, in their own way, were uh, terrific. They were a throwback. Brian Lowdrop could was was a player that, that he could do anything. He could have he could have been a defender if he wanted to. You know, he could tackle. He had obviously fantastic skills. Mm -hmm. He could pass. He could dribble. He was brilliant. You never saw the tackling aspect in the in the games more or less because he did, that wasn't his, his forty. But uh, he well, was you saw it in training. Yeah, you could see in training. We used to have the usual training Can I throw this games at you as well because you work with them all the time. Now I think this about Zidane, for example. Whenever you're up close to, when you see Zidane, you don't realise that he's a physical item, that he's oh, big absolutely. and strong. And yeah. Now Brian's not exactly the same dimensions as Zidane, but Brian was actually quite a big athlete, quite a oh, big, Brian, tall, Brian well built man. Whereas what you see, or what my mind's eyes tell me, is you see all the elegance and the balance and the movement, and he looks live yeah. and small when he's not. And I think that's a combination that people forget that to be built like he is, but still to be gliding over the pitch oh, as if strong. you're not touching it is. I think that's a big, big element in his he's, and uh, his brother's success too. And, and, and his makeup, it was, uh, it was great. So you know, for us, um, you know, the, the both of them were terrific. But they were, a, they took us away from you know maybe um, being a, a unit, if you like. You know, more or less, are the guys that, that played for us before, well, some exceptionally talented boys. You know, both these players were kind of individualistic, if you like, more than anything else. And um, you know, it was it was great. Brian I enjoyed the kind of freedom to play that we gave him, and they paid us back with a number of goals and uh, and fantastic performances. So. Um, I just hope that, that, you know, for any of the boys that, 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 that you play under, that, uh, uh, that, that you have us there and, and they play for a team, they enjoy it at the time. And the majority of the guys that, that we have enjoyed the football at Rangers. And uh, uh, they were, I think, uh, hopefully everybody remembers it as a great club and a great time in their career. What about managing Paul? It was, always a lot a, of it was always a challenge, uh, but mainly in, in, in the kind of um, the boyish aspects of it. He's you very, know, very funny. The, 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 the kind of the, the things. But when you take Paul Gascoigne, you take him knowing what you're taking. No use complaining about it. You know, you've got to, you sit down and say to the rest of the guys, look lads, we brought him in. He'll probably get away with a bit more than the majority of the rest of you, but he'll win us football matches, you know, and he'll do that. It was never bad, you know, in a, in a bad sense. It was always no. stupid things that, 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 that would, it would go and annoy you, things that, that, that um, you know, it was, it was kind of... Was, there a, car he wouldn't was even, there a car in the lock at one uh, stage? Uh, he wouldn't even know about, uh, about anything like that, you know, like... Uh, they just happened to him. They just come into his head and it happened to him. And the repercussions were always left to me or, the, or whatever. I must say, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Archie Knox handled him uh, fantastically and kept him out my road for the majority of... Uh, you liked him. Because you with, took uh, him in at Christmas. Uh, there was no way that you, you, you wouldn't... You, you wouldn't put an arm around him. You wouldn't think. like him. Um, yeah, d to a degree. Yeah, I also got a you know, be the other way with him as well. But, and that works for a period and then he <laughs> lapses back into what he was. But no one can take away the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, one of the most talented footballers of, of that generation of players. Instinctively talented. He's helped us learn as well, which I think is important, certainly to my perspective, in that we, 
There's been a great advancement of how to handle mental health issues in sport through his life after his career mostly. I think that's quite important because really that's the only thing that's caused him difficulties in that it, coping has not been his number one ability. And I, I've noticed a change in how we talk about things, what provision sport makes for the pressures. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the thing, you know, like when he lost the Gaza persona, mm. then yeah. that, that was almost going to cause him a, a, a bit of a problem. Uh, he loved football. Mm -hmm. but he knew that he was exceptionally good at it. And he, um, he never bogged himself down with tactics or anything like that that was involved in the team. It was just play. And that was Paul Gascoigne. You, you, there was Gaza, and that's what you got. Play him as a midfield player, and that was it. You know, he wasn't overall interested in having an understanding of formations and things like that. So when the football inside was going to leave him, you always felt that, that it was going to be a, a problem um, for him. But the one thing about him, uh, that everybody that knows him, I am sorry to see, but has eventually happened to him. And, you know, it's one of those things many, many people have tried to to help. And obviously, with those giving him that help, if it's not working out the way it should be, then there's obviously a very, very deep-rooted problem there. And that's that brings a kind of sadness to you, you know, that having seen... Um, a talent. I always remember one day I, I, I met Billy Conley and he said to me, he said, uh, how are you getting on with Gascoigne? And I said, uh, as usual, at the mention of the name, you start to laugh. And he said to me, well, I always remember that you have to live with a genius. The genius will never live with you. And I always remember that statement. And that was Paul Gascoigne. He, we had to live, everybody's had to live with him uh, and his time. And but what he brings He's and what he brought it. to us football-wise was, was what fantastic. I what I think I'm asking as well, and I'm certainly proposing a little bit, I knew him just a millionth, just two, three meetings, whatever, every now and again. If you take away his demons and you take away the difficulties that he's had, which are not of his own making, some of them are inherited and whatever, he's a hell of a human being as well. He's a hell of a uh, guy. It, 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 you know, he's genuinely funny, nice, thoughtful. And it's not just a fool's, I'll give you anything. It, there's a propulsion of, of genuine... If you take away all the football talent and take away the pressure and maybe make his overall life as a man maybe even better, it's a really good, funny, quick, bright-minded guy in there too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all, all that, that aspects of it, they're all there. They're all there. But, you know, you, you just felt whatever underlying... I mean, we're not, and I'm not, intelligent enough to know what is causing him um, the problems that he, that he has at the present moment. In fact, I don't think many people are because no. everybody seems to have had a go and, you know, unfortunately, not a lot of it seems to be working. So for those of us that, that, that know him, um, and I, I would say that you know, probably most people that know him, you know, from the footballing perspective anyway, we, we all wish he could eradicate those aspects from him and get back to to some kind of normality, but uh, I saw him two days ago day will... coaching kids. The people saying thank you for coming, mounting a session. He was fit. He was well. It, it may only be temporary, but I raise it because I think that when people listen, um, I think it's worth highlighting what was good about him, what he was good at, what type of person he's like. Frustrations and bumps aside, and we all wish him his well-being. But uh, my perspective is, I watched him. And I saw him. One of the happier times of his life and his career uh, working for you. And I bet that by the time we get Gaz on the big interview, he'll have uh, good things to say about being managed by Walter Smith. That's my proposition. <laughs> and as in the majority of our conversations uh, over, our, over yeah. the years, you can bat that away if you want. Um, it's been good going back over the, the triumphs of your career. Very interesting. I feel we've touched a bit the surface of it by about 5%. So when we come back for more, 
But you've got golf calling your way, so that's more important <laughs> than this. When you when you retire, um, you know, and uh, you miss the kind of competitive aspect that football brings to you. I think more than anything else, you know. So um, golf sort of brings it back to me. I mean, the uh, where you compete with yourself as much as anything else. and uh, Is there anything worse than competing with yourself? It's the most frustrating that's game in the world. That's where you drive yourself absolutely, <laughs> completely bonkers. It's, a, it's a the most frustrating game in the world. I started playing late and uh, I sometimes wonder why I do it. But um, anyway, yes. F um, favourite shot, favourite club? It's just getting... Good around the greens? Oh, I'm just... Uh, I, don't have, uh, I don't have any favourite club. I just, I just enjoy. I, 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 it keeps you active. I mean, you get a... a uh, ruins a good walk, people were, I would always say, but um, no, I love it, I, th I think it's great, I watch it quite a bit, I'm quite fascinated by, after trying to, to play, even though it did start later on, um, I don't know how these guys do it, I don't hmm. know whether I would like to, uh, to have to sink three foot putts for, um, for an awful lot of money. And, uh, You've given me my outline, I would, like, if I was sitting and you were at the Masters and it was a 16 foot putt to win it, my money would be with the bookies that that ball would go in the hole. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Uh, That's what I've learned over no, the years. No, I've been to Augusta you. and I can assure you that uh, the greens it, in Augusta well, are not conducive putt. to that. It's an uphill putt I've <laughs> given you to win it. Uh, Walter uh, Smith, Masters champion, green jacket, blue heart. Uh, I've enjoyed that very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, a, a, a fabulous football career and uh, well explained. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket. You can enter exclusive competitions and put your questions to our future Big Interview guests by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.